Well, hey friends, I'm excited to start the second part of our conversation on a time to embrace. And this last week, I have to say, I was humbled and, and also heartbroken over the number of people who emailed me and shared how much that first message, the message of God's big party and our small guest list, how that not only resonated with them, but the incredible amount of pain that exists in our own congregation around this subject matter. And especially as we talk about a facet of this subject matter that's so key and huge in the coming weeks and even today, which is how we embrace sexual minorities in our community and in our own families. And I wanna honor and uh, thank those of you who had the courage to email me and share your own experience. Some directly for individuals in our congregation, some through their children or grandchildren or very good friends. And so I hope that as a community, some of us might feel tempted to feel like this is uh, a word and a conversation that they're not wanting to have during Lent. And I want to just urge you to lean in and to listen to the stories of others and also to the story of God and how what breaks the heart of God should break our hearts. And so if something breaks the heart of Jesus, would we listen to that? And I hope you can, and I hope we can today as we enter into the second part of the conversation. Now, if you didn't uh, have a chance to, to check out that message from last week and listen to that message, I urge you, stop right now, go back and listen to that message because I'm building on this concept from week to week. And uh, last week we talked about God's great big banqueting party, his banqueting table. And yet the phenomenon within the Judaism camps for uh, purity, their obsession for purity, to eliminate certain people from the guest list. And yet God has invited a huge guest list of people we otherwise and often wouldn't think God would invite. And so God's embrace towards the outsiders, those on the margins, is something that we have to reclaim as a church. And we have to learn how to do this differently than what we're seeing in our broader culture, and specifically within the broader church of America. Okay? So today, what I want to do is I want to talk about, before we can get to conversations about actual scripture passages that deal with, what are traditionally called the clobber passages, uh, that address homosexuality and sexual minorities, and before we even get to the conversation I, I want to lead us in, which is a theology of shalom. And that conversation is going to be so helpful, uh, especially because it's the third way gift that allows us all, whether you're in the progressive side theologically or maybe more conservative side theologically, that all of us can find ourselves within a theology of shalom and find peace with that, but also have a sense of joy and anticipation as to how God might use us through a theology of shalom. So know that those two conversations, the clobber passages, and a theology of shalom are coming next. But before we can have those conversations, we have to talk about what I call the thing behind the thing. The thing behind the thing. Okay. Uh, last year I had sh shoulder surgery, and one of the things I learned in going to my doctor was that there was a pain on the front of my shoulder. But the real problem wasn't on the front of my shoulder, it was the thing behind the thing. It was deep within my shoulder. I had to have shoulder reconstruction because my shoulder was so torn up after years of football and CrossFit and other sort of uh, uh, athletic uh, you know, things that I did. And so we can't really get at healing. We can't really get at the core of the conversation that we need to unless we address the thing behind the thing and we get clarity on what that looks like. Okay? So I want to talk about the thing behind the thing, and it's going to take a little bit to get there. But we're going to open up to Acts chapter 8, and one of the most remarkable, but also one of the most difficult passages to reconcile when it comes to the way that we think about human sexuality and sexual minorities and inclusion, okay, and embrace, okay. So uh, it starts with this thing behind the thing, which is that we all, as human beings, have an instinct to protect ourselves and to protect our values when we're confronted with someone who is different. Okay, get that and catch that and be clear. We are all uh, uh, 
uh, born with an instinctive nature to protect ourselves from those who are different than us. And last week I shared about how uh, Jesus disrupted the religious elite, the religious Pharisees, and their desire for purity above embrace, and their desire for uh, Ju- Judaism's purity laws and codes that uh, needed to be accomplished before anyone could be invited into the family or into the, the tradition and the faith of Judaism. Okay, And the fact is, purity laws are still happening to this day. We're still doing it. But you realize that one of the primary things and objections that people had to Jesus himself was the fact that he didn't care about purity and that he ate with people who were impure, according to Judaism. He ate with sinners and tax collectors. He was accused of that all the time. And he had fellowship with people that otherwise didn't belong. He would touch people, lepers, the people who needed healing, people who were seen at that time as cursed and suffering under the curse of their own sin, he would touch them and he would redeem them and he would embrace them back into the family of God. This is a major facet of why Jesus was crucified and what we're working up towards when we get to Palm Sunday and then of course Holy Week and Easter morning. But you realize this is one of the primary objections to who Jesus was. And so before we get into this further, I want to look at uh, this concept through one of the more confounding stories of the Lord's work and the Spirit's work in the very first conversions uh, that occurred with the Apostle Philip. And the very first story of conversion for a non-Jew in all of the Bible and all the New Testament, of course the context is this is after Jesus has died and ascended up to heaven, uh, resurrected and ascended up to heaven, and then he establishes the church through the Holy Spirit's coming and indwelling in the people of God. And of course, there were conversions happening, but no specific stories yet. And there's a sorcerer that we believe had some sort of uh, background in Judaism. But the very first conversion that ever happens in the Bible happens with someone who would never have been included before Jesus came to this world. Open with me to chapter 8 of Acts, and it starts with verse 26. This is precisely who God wanted to include at his big party. Okay, Listen to these words. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. I want to stop right there. Notice, who's directing the action here? Is it Philip? No. This is the angel of the Lord, so a messenger sent on behalf of God for an encounter and a conversion to occur. Can't even give Philip credit for this one, although he's going to be a major player in this story. Okay, Verse 27. So he, Philip, started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandaki, which means queen of the Ethiopians. Her name, by the way, was Candace. This is historically uh, uh, something that we know uh, to be true of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Again, the second prompting, Holy Spirit, messenger of God through an angel, sending Philip to this man. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Okay, let's pause right there. Remarkable stuff here. I love, first of all, that Luke uh, tells us that the eunuch invited Philip into his world. And it wasn't Philip going to a temple or some place and, and drawing this Ethiopian eunuch to himself, but instead it was the Lord pursuing this eunuch, this man. And Luke tells us this man was a eunuch. Now, I don't want to dwell on this, and this can get a little bit complicated, and, it, and it, it's a little bit part of the ugliness of that culture and time. But what this meant was that this man was mutilated, most likely in his early adolescence, for service to the court of Ethiopian royalty. Okay? And uh, it was a terrible practice, as you can imagine. Uh, it was done towards people who were in servitude to protect the purity of the uh, royal court, uh, but also so that no sexual impulse on behalf of the servants would ever sully that particular 
uh, time and place in Ethiopia. Okay? It was cruel. It made someone's family line end and they could have no children and they could have no descendants. This is a key aspect to the story. Okay? And it was impossible really that as such being a eunuch that this man could have been Jewish at the same time. Because different from Ethiopian practice, the, the Jews saw someone like this Ethiopian eunuch as someone who was defiled and was uh, polluted, was unclean, was debased. We don't use the word defiled very often, but it would be, it would be something that we would say is uh, unnatural. Uh, it's not part of God's design or order. And that's how the Jews would have treated someone like this Ethiopian eunuch. And yet he was still drawn to, and at some point in his business affairs, bringing him to Jerusalem, he was drawn to the temple. He was drawn to Judaism. He was drawn towards the Lord. But he needed someone to tell him and to share with him what the scriptures really meant. And so at some point he got his hands on a passage from Isaiah, maybe one of the scrolls he could have purchased, and, and, uh, and to start learning about the Jew, Jewish faith and of course then through Philip learning about Jesus himself. But you can't miss this. This man did not fit the categories of acceptance for Judaism. Uh, he didn't come close to fitting even their concept of purity. And so he was an outsider. Now, before we rush to judgment towards Jewish practice and Judaism in that day, we need to know that we are all wired with this internal tendency towards thinking of people or things as pure or impure. Okay? I've recently been exposed to someone that uh, Pastor Mike has, uh, has introduced me to, a phenomenal teacher. He's a psychologist and a researcher, and he also is a Christian who preaches and teaches around this concept of clean and unclean. Okay? And he teaches, and one of the things he talks about is the deep biological urge to punish or resist people who we view as imperfect or have failed our expectations or don't behave like we expect them to behave or don't do what we expect them to do. Okay? And I'm going to give you just an example of how this works. Say that your, uh, your friend, maybe it could be your daughter or your son, has just gotten a new job as a waiter or waitress at a restaurant. And they say, hey, we'd love, I'd love for you to come down and uh, have a meal. And of course you show up and let's say this is your son that's the, the waiter. It's a horrible night at the restaurant. I mean, nothing's going right. And those of you who've worked in the service industry know that there's just nights in restaurants where the kitchen isn't doing the, doing the work in a way that, that is timely. And maybe someone didn't show up that was supposed to. And so you're down a staff member or whatever it may be. But but imagine if it was just a horrible night, the, the food comes to you and it's cold and it's, it's not what you would expect at a restaurant or, uh, or want. But then when your son or your daughter or your friend says, I'm so sorry how this happened. What, what's our natural instinct towards our friend or towards a family member? Be like, all of us would say, oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Because the waiter, the waitress, or maybe even the chef or the owner of the restaurant is one of our people. And we give grace and we give mercy because they're one of ours. Now contrast that to if you didn't know the waiter or waitress. In fact, I just had this happen a couple days ago with a dear friend. We were having dinner together and uh, we were finally able to get the waitress to be able to take our orders for our drinks. And then it took a long time even to get a menu. And then finally, 20 minutes later, we were finally able to pull somebody's elbow and say, hey, can we put our dinner order in? And and over the course of the meal, we decided to, to you know, order a bottle of wine, but the wrong wine came and, and it came, it was red wine, it was cold. And, uh, and what's all of our natural instincts in that situation where not only did we receive poor service, uh, but, but some of what we received had spoiled or it wasn't right, it wasn't pure, it wasn't, it wasn't served correctly. What's our tendency? Our tendency is to punish. We don't leave a tip. We leave a lesser tip. But the third way of Jesus flips that sort of notion on its head, and it says that person, even though they're not your daughter or son, even though you're, they're not your mother or father or a friend, is somebody's mother 
or somebody's father. And that waitress, or that chef, or that restaurant owner, is somebody's friend. And so one of the things we have to be aware of, the thing behind the thing, is that we have biases towards what we understand as our own people. People who look like us, who behave like us, who have the same desires and preferences as us. Okay? And what Dr. Richard Beck talks about is that there is this uh, biological but also psychological thing that happens in every single person, but especially for those of us who bear the name of Jesus and want to be like Jesus, is that we try to protect ourselves from those things in the world that we see as impure. And of course, that works uh, to protect us when it comes to food or certain environments. Uh, nobody goes into the, the grocery section uh, uh, of the you know, grocery store and looks at a spoiled piece of cabbage and says, yeah, that's what I'm eating tonight. No, you look through and you try to find the best, the stuff that won't spoil, right? Impure, clean or unclean. We, in our minds, do this all the time, Beck says. And we've done this a lot when it comes to COVID, haven't we? Fearful of others who may be clean, may not have the virus, but then what about those who are asymptomatic and those who do have symptoms? Or what if you were on a plane or you were in a room where you sneezed and you all of a sudden saw the glares because now you feel unclean? We do the same thing the Pharisees do and did. And we cause harm when we do that. And we resist certain people as impure and we don't even uh, consciously recognize that we're doing it. And this is part of the problem of what we've seen in religion in the world, is that religion often reflects and intensifies that instinct. Okay? But when we allow uh, our disgust and our own judgment on who we determine is clean or unclean, who is the sinner and who is the saint, that is the problem that here in the story of Scripture is being exposed through not only the life of Jesus, but now through the apostles and to this very first conversion. A man who formerly would have been seen as an extreme outsider and as terribly unclean, defiled even. Okay. And so when we do that, we have to know, and I have to get clear on this, friends, is that by not addressing this thing behind the thing, our tendency to see people as clean or unclean what we don't realize is that we're doing immeasurable harm, especially to those who are on the margins and don't feel like they have a people or don't feel like they belong or that they're normal, okay? Of course, none of us ever feels really normal, but you get the idea, right? And so what's remarkable here in this story is that God would direct Philip, the first non-Jewish convert, that he would direct Philip to this eunuch. And eunuchs were on the other side of the culture war. And let me take this even further so it really hits home, okay? They were strange and they were different to so many people. And while I can't say how this man may have identified himself, he would have most definitely found community and embrace in our time. He would have found community and embrace within the LGBTQ community. And let that sink in. And you're not going to convince me, I don't think I convinced many people, that for most churches in America, for most churches in the world, that the Church of Jesus Christ would embrace the Ethiopian eunuch the way that the Spirit of God in the first apostles did. And that is a problem. Please hear me. This is a problem. It's doing immeasurable harm. It is placing shame and it is uh, taking away the image of God, the imago dei that we, we talk about all the time here. The imago dei that is in every single human being. And then we declare, certain people are clean, others are unclean. And it breaks my heart that the Ethiopian eunuch would most likely in, in our day, I mean, I, I don't think you could really argue otherwise that he would have found embrace in the LGBTQ community, but not necessarily the Jesus community. And he would have been on the margins of really any community in which he 
entered. He certainly would have been on the margins within the communities outside the Ethiopian ones. But the Spirit of God led the Apostle Philip to the very first non-Jew to faith in Jesus. And he was a black man who was a sexual minority. Listen to what happens next. And this is, oh, this is so good. What happens next, starting in the verse, let's go to verse, oh, I don't know, 32. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. And this is a description that Isaiah is using to talk about Jesus himself. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice, that is Jesus. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is this prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. I wonder, as you think about that passage, and if you have your scriptures in front of you, if you looked at all the descriptors of Jesus in that short section on what Jesus would endure, what do you think the Ethiopian eunuch would have identified with most? Something that many of us would never identify or see overtly, or at least plainly. I want you to look at verse 33 again. Listen to these words, okay? these descriptors. Which word would the Ethiopian eunuch grab hold of? In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants, that is his family line, his children and his children's children, and the legacy of his own family? For his life was taken from the earth. I find it remarkable and beautiful that this Ethiopian man would so identify with Jesus and may have a lot more in common with Jesus than we would suspect or even some of us have in common with Jesus because he too, just like Jesus' life was taken from him, the Ethiopian eunuch's seed was taken from him and both would not have descendants on this earth. Both would be uh, unable to have children both would experience injustice. Now, can you let your heart break for a moment over the experience of, that this man would have had in hearing about Jesus? This man who in a culture and time that saw curses of God upon those who couldn't bear children. The curse of God was on those who couldn't have a family line. Curses on those who were mutilated or had disfigurement that now it's being reversed and he's invited to be a part of God's big party and God's big family. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus' life, just like the eunuch's seed, had been taken from him. And that Jesus would then uh, be the one to whom Philip would reveal and then they would baptize him in water in just the next few passages and he would celebrate his own death and resurrection with Christ into his own life. And if you know anything about the Ethiopian eunuch is he would go on to evangelize his own nation and share the love of Jesus and he would establish the church of Ethiopia. And in Jerusalem to this day, at uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, there is an Ethiopian chapel just to the right. And it's a very beautiful place. And there you'll see a picture of the Saint Philip and of course the Ethiopian eunuch that began the story of Jesus in that community. But I wanna hone in on something here and that is that uh, we don't know how this man would have self-identified, but he would have been on the margins and possibly identify as intersex. I don't know. We'd, he, only he could, could share how he would identify as a human being. But this speaks to, I think, one of the issues we deal with, and I want to I draw some obvious parallels now to our day and our life and what I'm learning. And I'm learning as I listen. Not as I speak or I study as much as, as I listen to people and their experience, but there are obvious parallels from this picture of God's embrace to the Ethiopian eunuch, to an outsider. But I, I need to make sure that we can bridge this accurately and do this well. 
So here's the thing behind the thing. Here's the issue behind the issue that we can't even talk about scripture passages relating to uh, difficult subject matters if we're not willing to address the fact that we in ourselves have a barrier. We have a hitch in our hearts that when we encounter someone different, our immediate response is to step back and be guarded and to reject. And deep in the recesses of our hearts are suspicions of others. And will they challenge my values? And will they make me have to believe something that I don't want to believe? And a lot of Christians fear that if they embrace certain kinds of people and certain kinds of lifestyles, that they'll be embracing sin. But I got to tell you, friends, that's just not how Jesus lived his life. Jesus himself embraced and related with spectacular sinners. And he invited them in to the family of God. Now, later on, we're going to talk about how do we know what is sin and what isn't sin. Okay, And I want to be clear on that. But Jesus didn't start with purity laws. And he didn't start with the instinct that you and I have, which is to see outsiders as suspicious and to place distance between himself and those outsiders. Instead, he embraced and he leaned in. And we today, friends, should live that same way. We today should ponder the fact that the first non-Jew to come to faith and baptism in Luke's story of his gospel and the book of Acts is a black man who is a sexual minority from Africa. And make no mistake that Luke is doing this intentionally. This is even before the apostle Paul himself is converted. The great writer of all the epistles and letters in the New Testament. This is the story that God intended to happen first. And now I want to address something. Okay? okay? And I know I'm going a little bit long today, but I want to make sure we're clear on something. At this point in time, it would be really easy for uh, some to say, hey, this is a fantastic message. I have so many people I wish would hear this. Right? And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not someone who struggles with racism or homophobia. I think I'm a pretty good person, right? I think a lot of people would listen to this message. And go, I, I, I can come alongside this. You may even say, say to yourself, you know, all this talk of embrace doesn't apply to me. I accept people and I, I don't think they're disgusting. You may even see the way that the church uh, at times in our culture or religion in general has treated certain people and, and certain outsiders with contempt or judgment. And you may even say that really upsets me. And I want to I want to condemn that behavior. But this is where I want to push a little bit further. Is this phenomenon of unclean and clean is a universal emotion. And whether it be someone who votes differently than us, or looks different, or is part of a different denomination, or uh, whatever it may be that is difference that we, we struggle with, that is where the hitch in our heart occurs. And we stutter to be able to embrace. And we stutter when it comes towards welcoming that outsider or that person who is different into my world or into my group. And so we're like the eunuch. We struggle with inviting people onto our wagons. And we're like, I, I don't want that person. In fact, in our minds, we might even think that person's not as enlightened or as smart or as holy or righteous. And so I'm not going to invite them onto my wagon and onto my chariot. And all of us have this hitch. And if the person before me is not of my group, and in my little enclave, there's a slight hesitation to see them as not as smart or as worthy or as uh, deserving of my love or respect. This is anyone different than you. Like, you know, PC users. <laughs> Or, you know, people that just do, do things differently, right? Anything where there's a difference. Jesus' third way calls us to challenge that. And so we tend to, by our human nature, it doesn't matter where you fall, right, left, uh, you know, uh, wherever your political preferences are, wherever your faith tradition comes from, we tend to regulate who we think is in and who we think is out. And we have got to challenge that problem because the person who determines who's in or out is Jesus and it's the, the Lord's embrace 
and especially in our politically correct culture that ruthlessly cancels people who behave out of, outside of certain norms or make mistakes, we even in those cases have to be countercultural with the third way love of Jesus. And so when we see Jesus' radical acceptance of everyone, then we can see that purity and our desire to regulate who is inside and who is outside of our given group is something that we all do. And all of us are guilty of it. And all of us have to confess and say, Jesus, please forgive me. My embrace is closed to certain kinds of people and certain kinds of conditions. And it's not just sexual minorities, friends. I hear heartbreaking stories these last three, four months about exclusion towards family members because of their voting differences or their party differences or how they act or how they live or how they behave in ways that they don't like. And so we dehumanize when Jesus calls us to humanize. Friends, the next coming weeks are going to be huge. And I'm going to talk about something that I know this is going to disrupt some people of how God is leading me to be an affirming pastor towards sexual minorities. And you deserve to hear directly from me as to how I got there. And I'm going to hold some special times in the future where we can have some Zoom calls as a congregation. And it's open game, fair game. You can ask away. You can ask some of our elders questions. But how I am coming to personally, I'm not requiring anyone else to do this, but I am coming personally as a pastor to a place uh, that is trying to really be like the way of Jesus, the way of embrace. And part of that means I have to stop living with a purity mindset on who is clean and who is unclean. Fact is, friends, all of us are unclean without Jesus. And he never expected us to become pure ourselves. He does what we couldn't do. He is the only righteous person to ever live. And so let's follow that way of Jesus and let's embody that way of Jesus to everyone around us this week. No doubt this week you're going to be challenged with someone in front of you. Maybe it be, may be a character on a TV show or someone who you just look down on it with disdain. And I want you just to catch yourself, is to see how this dynamic plays out of clean and unclean and the desire to punish or resist people who are different than us and to resist that tendency and instead say, Jesus, what are you teaching me and what can I learn by this person's experience and story? And if we do, we will become more loving, gracious people. May it be so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.